Good morning, everybody. It's good to see y'all here. Uh, we're so glad that you're here with us. Um, if you would, just stand and let's uh, lift our voices to God and sing together and praise Him with uh, blessed assurance. is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. you chose to be a part of today's worship with us. If you're visiting with us, we're obviously very thankful that you chose to make this a part of your experience today. There should be a little card there if you're a first-time visitor in front of you in a seat back. Put that in the um, offering plate after you fill it out and we'll have a record of your visit. But like I said, most of us, I think, know one another in here. And if we don't know you yet, we want to get to know you. One of the things I love about our church is really, it's, it's really like a family uh, in so many different ways. And we... Uh, have fun together, fellowship together, lift each other up through difficult times. And, you know, we all take a moment every Sunday and, and pray for some folks specifically. Thinking about this morning, uh, Miss Sandy, and I know that she's may or may not be watching this, but she's been weak this past, you know, few days. And you know, it's getting more and more difficult. And, you know, just the reality of the situation that as you, you know, get towards the end of whatever that may be of, of your battle with cancer and, you know, going through those struggles and, you know, when you have family in this world that we live in, we're all so mobile and folks live off and you just got the whole, man, just, uh, just the difficulty of figuring out the logistics of all that. I was talking with Ms. Clarice earlier about, you know, um, the challenges that she's going to face coming up with her family member and, you know, just, it's just part of it. And I, I think about this because in some ways we're real sad because none of us are excited to see our loved ones or our friends struggle and, and face these types of things. But the good news is we have hope that just like the seasons change, somebody mentioned today, today's the first day of fall. I don't know if you know, they don't feel like it outside, but the first day of fall. And guess what's going to happen? It's going to start cooling off. 
those leaves are going to change and they're going to fall and they're going to die and it's going to get cold and there are going to be some things that we enjoy about that season and then winter's going to come and then spring's going to come and it's all going to start over and you know what that's the way life is it just keeps moving it keeps rolling and so I want to encourage you today unlike the physical seasons we all go through different emotional and spiritual seasons in our life and I want to encourage you to to recognize that in whatever season that you find yourself maybe you're watching this and you're going through a particularly difficult season in your life try to see the beauty in it don't don't minimize and forget about the pain and the the difficulty that's there because it's real and no one would try to deny that but sometimes within that pain within the death that you see around you new life comes new things happen and so I hope that no matter what you're facing today, that you can see God working in those seasons. I think they're going to do a song about the evidence. And so I, I would encourage you, as you face some of these things that, that some of you are facing today, this week, and are going to face, look for the evidence of what God's doing in that season. And it's not going to make all the pain go away, and it's not going to make everything that's wrong right, but I tell you what it will do, or at least it's done for me is you'll see some of how God's using that. And it'll give you some hope and some encouragement that, hey, if God can even use this challenge, this difficulty, this season, then what's he going to do whenever things start to turn around? And so maybe you need to pray today for yourself. Maybe someone in particular comes to mind that you're thinking of. You know, as I lead us in the congregational prayer, I ask you, say a prayer for the person that comes to your mind. Don't just... Don't just let this be a time where we do, and not that there's anything wrong with the old thank you Lord for the food prayer, because in some ways there is value in giving gratitude in any way that we can. But how about in this next just say 30, 45 seconds, let's don't pray a thank you Lord for the food type of prayer. I want you to think specifically about one or two people that really need a touch from God and say a prayer of meaning about that. And if, if you don't have the words, just meditate for a second. But just align your spirit with God to ask him to be a part of someone's life and to work through whatever they're going through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this moment, as we gather together as believers here at the Pineville Christian Church, we confess, Lord, our great need for you. Our recognition is apparent of our sinfulness and our brokenness and our failures. And we are very grateful for the forgiveness that is offered through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as believers in Jesus, we have been commanded to bear one another's burdens and to pray for one another. And so that's what we do. We lift up those who are in need today. We pray, God, for a movement of power upon them. For those who need healing, Lord, we pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ. For those who need help, we pray for the help that is provided through any means that you work in this world. For those who need hope, we pray, God, that they would sense your presence and the recognition of the hope, not only in the abundance of the life that can be found here, but in the hereafter. As we think about some of our folks, family members, who are approaching what seems to be the end of their days here, we pray for strength, comfort, and we pray for victory upon whatever life may present them. We pray for the strength that we need to help them walk through these days. Help us, Lord, to remember that all of our days, even the youngest, healthiest among us, are numbered. And that this life is just a glimpse of the life to come. And we pray for the courage and the faith to live our lives here in such a way that we are prepared for our eternal life with you in heaven. As we continue to sing our songs and to pray, 
and to listen and to learn. May all of these activities bring honor and glory to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with us as we continue to sing together? Sometimes the greatest evidence is heard in that uh, quiet, still, small voice when you're able to shut everything else out. All throughout my history Your faithfulness is walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season From where I'm standing I see the evidence of your good all over my life, all over my life, I see your promises and fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life, help me remember when I'm weak. Come the fear will leave and my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my Fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. I see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, Lord Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave. The evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my All over my life, all over my life, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life, I see your promises and fulfillment. All over my life, all over my life. So why should I fear the evidence is here? So why?
something has to break. Yeah. Right now in your name, something has to break. Something has to break. Holy Spirit is moved, cause when you have your way, something has to break, tear down every lie, set the wrong thing right, cause when you have your way, something has to break. Something has to break. Oh, something, something right has to break. Right now, right, right now, now in your name. Something, something has to break. Lord, something has, something has to break. Something, something has to break. Right now, right now in your name. Something has to break. Lord Jesus, we all come in here today with all of our own individual needs. We know people who have needs and they need a touch from you right now. And Lord, we recognize that only the Holy Spirit can deliver what is needed. So Lord, we're just asking that you not just move in this place, Lord, but move across the globe of this planet, Lord Jesus, and make wrong things right, God. Touch those who need a touch from you, Lord Jesus. Break those chains in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to move. God, we believe it. I believe you'll lead me through it. I believe you'll get me to it. I believe that you will do it right now. Something has to break. I believe you'll lead me through it. I believe you'll get me to it. I believe that you will do it right now. Something has to break. I believe you'll lead me through it. You will do it right now. Something has to 
will happen. Breakthroughs will happen. Miracles will happen that only you can get the glory out of. Thank you, God. morning as we come to communion you know something you do every week but sometimes you think you know or maybe you don't but sometimes I think you know uh you know what do you do what are you doing I mean like what are we actually doing you know are we putting the thought into it and I went to a wedding last night where after the couple said their I do's and their uh vows they they shared communion and I uh I thought to myself as they're doing that. I, I was, you know, thought about communion. And as I as I think about it today, you know, you know what what are we doing? Why are we doing it? So if you go to Paul in the first first Corinthians chapter eleven, uh, verse twenty three, he's talking to the Corinthian church, and he says, you know, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on that night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> and the last, in verse 26, I think, in my opinion, is the most important. He says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <clears throat> you know, when you see the little do this in remembrance of, of me up there on the little, the little table, <clears throat> and we do this every Sunday, and sometimes it becomes a routine, but... You know, you don't have to do it here in church. It could be at a service. It could be at, at your house. I've heard Bob and them talk about after, at, before bringing cups to people that couldn't make the service, that wanted to do communion. Because if you're the last thing that says, whenever you eat or drink this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that's what, I, you know, I think this is. And that's what, you, you know, when you do it at a wedding is you're, you're saying, hey, you know, we're Christians. <clears throat> the Lord commanded us to do this. And we're going to. We're going to proclaim. It's a way of saying we're going to proclaim Jesus' death until he comes, and it's a way of kind of affirming that. So as we take this and our guys come up, <clears throat> remember that I know this can get routine and that, you know, if you, it can become just a habit we do every Sunday. But the importance of it is, you know, we're proclaiming Jesus' death, and, and that's the most important thing we, we, we can do. Uh, bow with me. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask that you would just uh, help us to remember the importance of your death. Help us to remember as we do these elements uh, what that truly means and, and uh, how, how important that needs to be to us. In Jesus' name.
Now let's uh, bow with me as we as we take our offerings. Lord, uh, I ask that you would just be with us to uh, bless the offerings that we're going to give. Lord, uh, help us know how to use them in your best way to help people in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. that song. Thank you very much. All right, boys and girls, if y'all are ready to head downstairs for Children's Church. You know, while they're heading down, I, <clears throat> that was a, a lot of truth in that song, right? Something has to break. Something has to break when God moves, because here's the thing, we can't stay the same. And let me tell you what has to break. What has to break are the strongholds that are in our lives. Listen, everybody who's here has strongholds in their life, if you're honest. Now, if, you, if you're honest and you're aware, there are strongholds in your life, strongholds of pride, possibly of greed, possibly of insecurity, possibly of apathy, sexual deviance, substance abuse, all of these things that can be strongholds in your life to keep you from being the person that God wants you to be. Stubbornness, whatever, all kinds of things, these strongholds. And look, I hope that you're here today. I'm here today because I want some of these strongholds broken in my life. And so the power of that is the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you where, where that takes place. And I didn't even know they were doing that song, but it fits perfect. Because it takes place in the mind. That's why the Bible says what? Be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. And so we're going to be looking today as we move through Acts chapter 17. And the title of today's message is Get Your Mind Right. Now, how many of you have ever had your dad or a figure or a person in your life say, Say, raise your hand and say, get your, you better get your mind right. Now, I don't know about your dad or the male in your life, but, but whenever I heard the term, you better get your mind right, it really wasn't about your mind. There was some actions that was about to happen that were implied that if I didn't get my mind right, that there was going to be some help coming along the way that was going to transfer information from my mind or from some other part of my body. Because then they were saying, look, get, get your thinking right. And look, that's so important because in this world today, I meet a lot of people whose mind is not right. Now, I'm not talking about particularly mental illness today or anything like that. I'm just talking about our mentality. 
And ultimately, we all struggle with these strongholds in our mind. And so we're going to see about some folks today that we talked about briefly a few, about three months ago as I just jumped ahead. And as we look at everything that's taking place in the world today, we really need to focus on trying to get our minds right. Now, I want you to stand real quick as I read this passage, and you'll see where I'm going with this today. Remember, Paul has been in Thessalonica. He continues on going to a new place. He goes there. Some people receive it. Some people don't. The people who don't get upset, they run him out of town, and he moves on, okay? And so we find ourselves at that place today in Acts chapter 17. As soon as it was a night, the believers sent Saul and Paul and Silas away to Berea, about 60 miles from Thessalonica. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews, listen to this, were of more noble mind than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. May God bless the public reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, this is a very unique word um, that we're going to see here in just a minute. But, but the state of mind is pointed to on these particular people. And so I want us to kind of... Think about something today. What is your state of mind? Now, I, when I hear the, the phrase state of mind, I can't help it, Bob. You know what happens to me is I think of Hank Williams Jr. and the country state of mind song. And I ain't saying that's a good song. That ain't always the right state of mind. But, but beyond that, what is your state of mind? And what do I mean by that? Well, today, is your state of mind closed-minded? Are you closed-minded today? Or maybe you're double-minded, another phrase used in the Bible. Or maybe, maybe you're open-minded in some senses, which is what we want to be. And some of the translations say open-minded, but I think a better translation is what we want to shoot for today, noble-minded. And so when we shoot for trying to get our mind right, I want us today to try to become noble-minded and be on a path to more and more noble-mindedness. Now, that word in Greek, you'll see there, is eugenistorio. I don't know how to paint, but it's, it's called, it's a person of noble character, open-minded. It's a more excellent disposition, more open to conviction, being less blinded by prejudice, teachable in the things of God, true nobleness and generosity of soul. And so, so you see, it's hard to just incorporate into one word about these Bereans. These people were known for the fact that they were this. They were noble-minded. Let me ask you today, are you noble-minded? Now, as we think about that, you should be striving to be that. This is the goal, to become more noble-minded. Certainly, we see plenty of people who are closed-minded. A lot of people are double-minded, and some have the sense of what I'm going to call open-minded, where just everything goes, and that's not what we're after. We're after noble-minded. So I want to ask ourselves rhetorically four questions today to help us see what this means. This will dramatically impact our lives if we can begin to understand this. The first question is, what is it? These are the four questions we're going to ask today if you're taking notes. Let's look at what it does not mean to be noble-minded. We're also going to look at what it means to be closed-minded, what it means to be double-minded, and then finally we're going to finish out with what it means to be truly noble-minded. So the first question, what it does not mean to be noble-minded. Number one, being noble-minded does not mean being gullible, okay? You're not called to be an idiot and to be gullible and to just accept that everything somebody tells you is true. Listen, I've said this over, and I don't want to belabor the point. People lie. People manipulate. People tell you all kinds of stuff. And so a noble-minded person has sense enough to realize that, hey, they, I'm, not, I'm not gullible, all right? So just because you become noble-minded doesn't mean that you become gullible. The second thing it does not mean to be noble-minded is being noble-minded does not mean that you deny, to, 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 to deny that truth is absolute. Look, some people take noble-mindedness and open-mindedness, if you will, and say, oh, well, everything goes. No, there is truth. There is reality. There's an absolute truth. Now, just because someone else says it's the case doesn't mean. So then you fall back to what do you rely upon 
as the source of absolute truth? And really, this is the million dollar question. Because if you don't have a basis for absolute truth, then, then you're left with whatever. As believers, the orthodox position throughout history has been that the scriptures, that the Bible contain the source of absolute truth as it reveals the person of Jesus Christ to us. And so, so just because you become noble-minded doesn't mean that, that you don't hold to an absolute truth. Also, number three, being noble-minded doesn't mean that you refuse to challenge and condemn false teaching. See, this is part of the difference between noble-minded and open-minded. Some people say, say well, I'm open-minded and anything goes. Open-mindedness in the sense that, oh, you believe that? Well, that's okay. I'm okay with that. Everything's true. No, no. Look, noble-mindedness has the courage to challenge false teaching. Now, it does it in a respectful, in a manner that's effective, but noble-minded people don't let others continue to spout off things that are not correct. Now, look, we live in an age where information is so polluted that it is beyond anyone's ability to be able to really keep up with everything. This is why noble-mindedness is so important. Anybody with a computer can get to an audience and say anything to any number of people, and it may not or may not necessarily be true, and I've talked about that. And you throw in AI and all this other stuff, and so you've got to learn that a noble-minded person, just because you're noble-minded, doesn't mean that you're unwilling to confront false teaching and to address it and challenge it when it comes. So that's what it does not, that's what it's not mean. What does it mean to be closed-minded? Because this is the opposite. So we're going to get at this from a different, few different angles. The first thing I want us to look at, because a lot of people are closed-minded, which is the opposite in some ways of noble-minded. Closed-minded people, we're going to keep my slides there, boys. We froze. All right, I just had to listen then, all right? So what good thing I got my notes today. Closed-minded people, number one, are irrational. You ever met somebody like that? They've already got their mind made up, and no amount of facts or amount of information is going to change their mind. They're irrational. Look, closed-minded people are irrational. They don't listen and they don't look. What did the Bereans do? Part of their whole process that's describing them as being noble-minded was what? Is they listened eagerly to Paul, and then they did what? They searched. They were not irrational. The second thing that I see in closed-minded people is that oftentimes they're anti-biblical. Now, this is ironic because typically the claim that people want to make is that if you embrace the Bible, well, then you're closed-minded and irrational. But I could, I, I am here to tell you today that the Bible has been the most progressive, best-selling book, the most dramatic you know, life-changing book and the record of the story of how God has worked in the world and it's contained so much truth. Almost all of the laws in the, the Western world, all of the legal precedents, all these different things that our society is built on that has made the world good is based on the principles that come right from the Bible. And so to think that, that being cl closed-minded people don't want to look at that, this is, is amazing. I watch the news sometimes or I watch people who are educated talk about this and they, they point to every other source of information out there but somehow they can't point to the Bible. Closed-minded people get to a point where they are anti anything that's in the Bible without a real discussion. Now granted we all know it's not as simple as oh just the Bible because we could parade up dozens of different people who have different perspectives on the Bible and some of them could be very much different from other people. But we all still at least are embracing the same source of truth. And this is what leads us to honest dialogue, discussion, trying to come to understanding. But when you get closed-minded people, they're, not, they're anti that. Oh, I'm, and we meet people, especially in this younger generation. Oh, the, I'm not interested in that. That's some religious book. The third thing, closed-minded people oftentimes foster hostility. Have you noticed that? Truly noble-minded people, whenever they encounter differing opinions, maybe a different perspective, maybe something they disagree with, they don't immediately get hostile, do they? They may ask questions. 
They may want to seek understanding. They don't have, you don't have to be hostile to someone whenever you disagree with someone. Man, what is the world coming to today? Have you, have, you, have you ever watched people have any discussion about different things and how hostile they get in just um, 30 seconds of disagreement? Look, when you see people who jump to hostility right away, you're pretty safe assuming that they're very close-minded. Because open-minded people, noble-minded people, don't get hostile whenever they see a difference of opinion. Now, they may ultimately come to a point where they forcefully disagree or they don't want to continue in a discussion with someone. And that's not talking about, talking about backing down. I'm just saying you don't need to foster hostility if you really want to help people come to understanding. It doesn't work well. Now, I got a little video I wanted to show. I could have explained this. We're going to have it or no? Okay, we won't do this one. What does it mean to be double-minded, okay? thought I had a little video, so I will go ahead and explain it. So double-minded is the phrase that I'm using that's found in the book of James where he's talking about how a double-minded man is, is a person who thinks one way, but then he thinks a different way. Or he, he, he has faith, but he doubts. And so a lot of people are double-minded. Have you ever met some folks? They, they go to church on Sunday and they do like this and then they get out there in the week and it's completely different. The, the things that they kind of believe don't affect everything. They have faith, but they have doubt. And so what's happening is they're just in this kind of place where their life is described in the Bible like a person who's drunk. Not quite stable. None of y'all know what that's about, I'm sure. But you know what I'm saying? Because y'all are good Christian people. But, but the, they're kind of just a little bit unstable. Like you're in a boat that's not moving is another analogy. In your life, mentally, as you're progressing, do you have stability, clear direction, walk in a straight manner? And I'm not talking about physical walking here. I'm talking about purpose, meaning, resolve, or, I don't know, maybe... I don't want thinking about that. I don't know about that. A lot of people are what? They're in that place in their life. That's not noble-minded. Noble-minded people are not double-minded. They look at all the information. They make the best decision that they can make, and then they go forward. But we're going to find a little bit later, and it doesn't mean they're set along that path forever. But whatever path they're going on, they're focused on. When you see people who are double-minded, they're just all over the map. A lot of people love to live in a world in a double-minded state. And they like to use a lot of religious language. They like to talk a lot about prayer. And they like to use a lot of the words that are important, right? And that have meaning. But the problem is... They don't have meaning when they're attached to the nonsense that you see going on with that. And you have to, again, part of this noble-mindedness is to have sense enough to realize that just because what's being said, the words that are being used, the, the, the fluff around, that those are all the trappings. What's real is underneath that. Now, when it's real, there are going to be appropriate words and there's going to be appropriate action, but... But the action, the life, the stability, that is what's most important. Don't get lost in the words. So we close today as we think about what does it mean then. We know what it does not mean. We see what some of the opposite things mean. But what does it mean to be noble-minded? And these are the three things I want us to focus on. Number one, noble-minded people give those with a differing belief a fair and honest hearing. Look, the Bereans were raised as Jews. They had a synagogue in a, in a pagan world. These were committed Jewish people, not unlike Paul and some of the folks in Thessalonica and some of the folks in Amphiphiona and some of the folks in all the other places. But what did they do? They gave Paul an honest hearing, a fair hearing. That's what noble-minded people do. When someone comes to you, with something that you may or may not necessarily agree with. You listen. You give them a fair hearing. Now, what I'm saying is when someone tries to talk to you 
and you've already made up your mind about everything that they're going to say before they say it, that's not an honest and fair hearing. And why is that so important? Because oftentimes the real message that people are sharing is a layer deeper than the words. You see, some people communicate oftentimes and what they're really wanting to communicate is different from the words they're using. This happens to all of us. If you study communication and learning and different things like that, a true person who wants to hear and listen and understand is going to try to ascertain what does the person really want to communicate. You know, and one of the ways that this has oftentimes been very, very clear to me, and I'm going to use Clay as an example because he and I have done some work together in the past. And, and I, I got to give him props. He's got a whole bunch of flaws, all right? And Ms. Rebecca will give you a list of them. But let me tell you one of his outstanding qualities is his ability to negotiate and read people. And he's oftentimes talked to me about that when we're dealing with it. And some of you in the other business know this. He's like, you got to listen for what people are really trying to say. Because sometimes what they're saying, that's really not the most important thing. There's something underlying that oftentimes that they really want to communicate, but they either don't know how or they're not comfortable yet. And so I thought I was thinking about that. I was like, if you really give someone an honest and fair hearing, you're listening on a level that's a little deeper. Not necessarily the words that they're using, even though that's part of it. It's, it's beyond that. What, what are they really trying to communicate to me? And, and I want you to think about this. Oftentimes when we deal with people who are quote-unquote non-believers and are struggling, many times they're wrestling with something internal. Some failure or weakness on their own part. Maybe they're trying to overcome some hurt, something that's happened in their own life. And that oftentimes comes out as either antagonism or, or argumentative stuff, all kinds of things. But if you listen long enough without opening your mouth and you have an empathy to what's going on, what amazingly will start to happen is you begin to see what they're really saying. And at that point, you now have an opportunity to address the real issue and open up a channel of communication. And if we're truly noble-minded and the kind of believer who wants to see others come to know God, that's going to be our goal, not to win the argument, not to prove that we're right, not to gain something. You know, to use the analogy, you know, in, in just the strictest sense, in a negotiation, we're trying to, to figure out what people want to make the deal happen, right? We want to see what's the real par the parameters for why to make a deal. But in this deal, the deal of Christianity, what's the goal? To glorify God. What glorifies Him? Seeing people come together, seeing people honor Christ, and people come to know Him. So when you listen to people of a different belief, listen with that in the mind, in the back of your mind. Is I'm, what are they trying to say? Does it mean you'll agree? And it doesn't mean that you're going to rubber stamp or say, hey, this is a good job, you're wrong. No, but you're listening in a fair way. The second thing noble-minded people do is they weigh beliefs and evidence in light of the truth. And the truth is the scriptures. And this is so important because many people today embrace open-mindedness, but they ain't real good for this one. Because see, at the end of the day, it's not everything is okay. It's not. There is a revealed truth in the scriptures, and that truth is that God cares about how we live and that what we do matters and that ultimately the things that we do as an individual and the things that have been done by the humans collectively have had a terrible impact on this world. On a catastrophic level, relationships, economics, socially, financially, look at it. That's not good. And the whole truth of the scriptures is that God has been in the process of trying to redeem humanity back to himself and fix all of that through Jesus Christ. 
And so, so this is the, the revealed truth of the Scriptures, and there's so much there. I mean, we spend years and years studying and preaching and all that. So when we encounter people with different beliefs, some who also believe the Bible, what do we do? We weigh those beliefs, and we look at the evidence of what they said. We think about it. And we look at what we understand about the scriptures, what the people in our lives that we trust understand about the Bible. And then that's how we formulate our opinion and our belief about that. How many of us today just believe something because somebody's passionate about it? Like, I, I'm amazed at that. You know, you can be passionately wrong. I mean, like, if you're a more passionate person, guess what? You're going to be more likely to be passionately wrong. Like, I, I see some folks who are very stoic, all right, in their personality. They're, they're, they never get real excited. They don't really get persuasive in their method of communication. And they could say something, and it would seem, you know, just, huh, okay, whatever. But it'd be true. You could have another person who's just as passionate and as animated and as persuasive as you could imagine and say something that's not true. And you know how many silly people will believe this one? Why? Because they're ruled by their emotions and they are not being noble-minded. Noble-minded people don't rush to decisions. They don't rush to conclusions. And look, this is very difficult for my teenagers, for my young people, because number one, you are very, very emotional right now for a lot of different reasons. There's all sorts of chemicals and things going in your body that are, that are helping you formulate how to do all of this. And so you got to be particularly careful during these times not to be swayed because so-and-so feels this way or you're that, that they're, they're passionate about it. Well, well, if they really feel that, well, how they feel about something is irrelevant to whether it's true. It still may be true, but it may not be. That's why parents, grandparents... You, you've got to be a gatekeeper in a lot of ways so that you don't allow young people to get swept off into nonsense. When you encounter these different beliefs, and we live in a world, and I'm telling you, it's, it's changed dramatically from since when I was a young person. I mean, when I was a youth, I'm 50 this year, not everybody was a Christian, and I'm not saying that it was a religious world in the same sense, but I'm telling you the vast majority of people I came into contact with in my younger life and what I saw within culture, most of it embraced the Judeo-Christian ethic. People kind of understood more about what was right and what was wrong. We, they, we all still did wrong. But let me tell you, the world is a-changing, and not for the best in that regard. And so you've got to really solidify that I'm going to use the scriptures as my basis for truth. And whenever I get information, I'm going to weigh it against those things. And finally, number three, noble-minded people, listen to this one, they admit when they've been wrong and make necessary changes. Look, the Bereans had been Jewish their entire life. And, but whenever they came upon this new information and they studied the scriptures and they prayed, what did they do? They changed. They said, oh, wait a minute. We hadn't been right on this, and they embraced Christianity. And that's what noble-minded people do. Whenever they get information, and they process it, and they come to an awareness that they were wrong, what do they do? They admit it. They say, I was wrong. How many of us have such a hard time admitting we were wrong? I mean, we ain't going to tell nobody we're wrong. Well, you know, because we're going we're gonna to say, well, I, I hear it all the time, well, yeah, I, I might have been wrong, but, but then they're going to they're gonna admit they're wrong in about a 2.1 millisecond clip. But then they're going to give you 10 minutes about why they were misled or why they did this or why they didn't do that. Look, don't do all that. When you're wrong, just admit you were wrong. And you don't really have to give everybody all the reasons you were wrong. Now, you might have to give a few people, and you might need to give them the appropriate response, but just, just admit when you've been wrong, the mistakes that you made, and then what do you do? You make necessary changes. Now, those changes can take a while. I mean, look, some of us have been wrong for a long time about a lot of things. Seriously. 
those, some of those are the strongholds. See, what, what, what people fail to recognize, and I say people, I'm talking about myself, okay, is the strongholds that are in your mind, they're the worst ones because you build those up to a place where anybody who challenges you, anybody who has information there, you create these situations and these scenarios where all, here are all the reasons why I'm right and they're wrong. And so when you come to a point under really the power of the Holy Spirit and you come to the awareness that you're wrong, you have an opportunity there. And this is what's scary for all of us. When you have that awareness that you're wrong, this is the most dangerous moment in your entire spiritual life. Because you can do one of two things. You can admit it and start making the necessary changes or listen to this, this is the worst one. You can know it for a second. But those changes that are in your brain, the changes that are required become so painful that you do what? You keep going. And here's what happens to you. It happens to every one of us. It's almost like, and Paul says this, it's like the conscience gets seared with a hot iron. And now what happens is, listen, don't miss this. Now it gets harder. It gets, now God is constantly pursuing you, right? He's pursuing you relentlessly to break this stronghold. But guess what happens is the more you turn your back on it and you, and you don't reply when he calls you, now it gets harder to hear and harder to become an awareness, which is the very reason why, if you're honest, you know that what used to make you feel really bad and what you knew was not right in your life, that you turned your back on it after all the different times you felt convicted about it or somebody said something, and now you look back and you're like, what has happened to me? How did I get to this place? One little slow step at a time. And the key moment is not when necessarily when somebody says anything or anything. It's when you feel that conviction and you come to that awareness. That's the moment that you got to say, God, forgive me. I got to get this ship righted. I got to do this, whatever it takes. And then just start doing that. Don't make it so complicated. Don't try to make it something that is abstract. It's, it really is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. When you know that, hey, I'm battling pornography and I need to stop this. Guess what? Deal with that right there. Or you know what? I've been lying whenever I feel like I'm in a crunch and I've been telling untruths. Deal with it right there. Or you know what? When I feel the need to, to get control of something, I spend money I shouldn't spend. Boom, deal with it right there. Or you know what? I lash out in anger and I say words I shouldn't say. Deal with it right then. Whatever it is. And look, the list could go on and on. And I'm not talking about any one better. Just whatever it is. When you, don't, don't start the list and all that. When you feel... The Spirit telling you it's time to address this. And that might just be that simple, I feel bad, or I need to do something. Act on it right then. This is what noble-minded people do. And I ask this question as we close, and I ask myself as much as I ask me, is your mind right? Is your mind right today? Now, many of us who have heard that statement Get your mind right, and we ask ourselves, is your mind right? How much better is it going to be? And I don't know the answer to this question, by the way, but I'm speculating. How much better will it be for you to get your mind right on your own while you can than to have to go through whatever the process is going to be when the Lord Get your mind right. I think back to my dad and some of the people in my life who made a statement like, get your mind right. And it was always easier. And it was always better. If when I came to that understanding, I fixed whatever was going on on my own. It, got, it went downhill fast. Whenever the outside agent had to start helping me get my mind right. I'm telling you today, some people's life is in chaos because the circumstances and the things that are happening are because they won't 
get their own mind right. And God is just stepping back, and he's letting, the, letting them have their own deal. And they're struggling, and they're fighting, and they're flailing, and they're miserable. Any the time for stop all that in every way. Today, I want you to do whatever it's going to take to start getting your mind right. And I want you to pray for me because I need to get mine right in whatever little area it is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit to break the strongholds that are keeping our minds from aligning with your will. Lord, if there's anyone here today who needs to make their profession of faith in your son Jesus, I pray that they would act upon that and would not rest until they have given their heart and life to you and have joined your family of faith through baptism in your son Jesus. Lord, as we continue on with this week, give us the courage, the resolve to do whatever it is needed to follow up appropriately. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Certainly appreciate you being here today. I hope that you strive, and I hope that I continue to strive to get my mind right in a better and better way this week. You'll see up there, look at here. I don't know. Good job, good job, real quick. Do we have a little, do we got an announcement, Todd, or is it just, where's all our? Well, hold on. Somebody already got all our socks. How, didn't we have a full thing already? Yeah, already? Awesome. Good deal. All right. So look, if you hadn't had a chance, I want to keep this. I think we got to fill this thing up every opportunity we get. So keep keep on with that. Also, don't forget our prayer bowl um, that's out there. If you have a special prayer request, um, fill that out, and we'll have it. You'll see some signs up. You want to tell us what's going on with those signs, Todd? Absolutely. So, so here's the thing. You know, I, I was amazed. You know, we're not a super large congregation by any means when you look at the sheer number of people. But every time that we've done this, they have been especially thankful and grateful for the number of people that have been willing to give in such a small congregation. Church is much, much larger. We'll have less people. And I'm thinking, man, really? I mean, now look, I understand if you can't. So I'm not talking about that. But if you can, I mean... To me, as often as I can, I give blood, and I think the church ought to promote that because, look, what that, <laughs> I, mean, I, hate to, I hate to belabor the point, you know what I'm saying, but somebody gave his blood for you, you know what I mean? So if you can give your blood to help somebody else, I want you to do it, sign up, and look, we got all this technology now, we got the barcodes and all that, so sign up online, so do all of that. Also, um, the fostering community team is continuing to do some things. We've got some other stuff there. If you got some some good toys to put in the uh, the nursery, we're gonna kind of restock some of that. And not we don't need the ones that little grannies you got from your granny that all the kids chewed on. Don't come up here with all that. But if you got some some decent toys, bring those and see Todd as well. Our Wednesday night activities are continued. Todd did mention he's going to be preaching next week, so I hope I want you to be here. I'm excited. He's going to be talking about Paul in Athens. I'm actually going to be in Canada. Me and, uh, me and David have had a trip. You know, he turned 16, and so we're going on a, uh, a trip up there, so I'm excited about that. So say a prayer for us that that all goes well. And, you know, I know this is selfish, but some of you will understand. Say a little prayer for the right kind of weather and, you know, and the good flight days and that kind of stuff like that, you know. Is, uh, is what we're hoping for. The Bible says ask, you know, and it will be given. I don't know if that's it, but we're going to do it. Bob. <laughs> hey, that's good advice because I went into the courthouse this week and I had my pocket knife and I forgot. So, yeah, don't worry. Gotcha. If you want to send a donation 
specifically earmarked to the Cuban ministry in the mission down there for the new roof and some of their facilities. You can earmark it in there. You can give it to myself, give it to Bob or whatever. So, Rogers, good to have you back. The, 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 the honeymoon and newlyweds from Alaska. The, uh, why don't you lead us in our closing prayer, sir?